It's Tauros time. Hello, I'm Marcel. And I'm Mrs. Snakeworks. As you can see, we have a box. Shall we open it? We got a box. We got a box! Call the bomb squad! I need a bomb squad! We got a box! Now, using our old friend, Andy the Knife, we opened the seal. No, oh, what's in the box? Not you give me the what's gun. in the box? On one of the box tabs is a QR code. I know some of you like to check these out, so please let us all know what this one is in the comments below. There's also a little crosshairs, which looks like the ones from Operation Wolf. When I was a lad, I had the demo of Operation Wolf on my Commodore 64, and I couldn't even get past the first level. Inside the box, we have another box, the Tauros. You might ask why there's also a Horus Heresy Assault Squad in there, but that's a good question for another time. Where'd you get that? A good question for another time. Man, those Star Wars sequels recently really were a letdown, weren't they? Apart from Rogue One, I thought that was quite good. We always like to check inside the box to make sure we haven't missed anything. Like a random £20 note, we've not found one yet, but there's always hope. Yet hope remains while the company is true. I thought you said you'd check this. Haven't is missing an E. So here we have it, the Tauros Venator. It's a lovely looking machine, isn't it? Let's get that cellophane off. Nowadays, I've noticed some Games Workshop kits come wrapped in cellophane and some don't. I'd like to know why that is. I don't like the ones that don't have cellophane as they feel like someone's already taken it off and have been fiddling with the inside somewhere. So, this is the front of the box. It shows the Taurus and the Necromunda logo. The back of the box shows us some weapon options and some of the optional stowage parts. Stowage? Stowage? Stowage. Okay. And also a painting guide, which I'm not sure is all that useful. Top of the box is just the Taurus and some logos. The side of the box, I think, I has... Tauros. Do you want me to go... Okay. No, you don't have to go back. I'm going to go back. So, the side of the box, I think, has the batch number or code on. That's a number next to the Made in the UK text. The bottom of the box has all the safety gumph that nobody ever reads. And the other side is pretty plain. Let's see what's inside if Marcel can manage to open it. Have they changed the cardboard? It looks softer. With the box finally open, we can empty the contents onto the desk. Inside the box, we have a set of instructions. A big main sprue a wheel sprue, another of those wheel sprues, and an enforcer sprue. That makes four sprues in total. And I know that because I counted. One, two, three, four, all together. Let's take a look at those contents. To begin with, we have what looks like a detailed and useful instruction manual. Hopefully there's no errors in it. Here's our Enforcer Sprue. It has all the Enforcer bodies on and their weird weapon, the Concussion Cannon or whatever it's called. There's also a couple of parts for the actual Tauros on there too. Notably, the rear side skirts and the cockpit surrounds. This is the Wheel Sprue and as you can see, there's a lot of wheels on there. I reckon they should sell this sprue separately. It would be really handy. There's also some suspension parts on there and a little stowage like a jerry can and a backpack for the crew to keep their sandwiches in. Do people still eat sandwiches in the 41st millennium? If not, what do they eat? There's also another of the wheel sprues. I forgot to mention before, there's also some wheel hubs and things to mount them on this one. And here is the main sprue. There's lots going on here. I like how the main tub for the chassis reminds me of a Tamiya radio controlled buggy kit. That gives us an idea for the future. Shall we convert an RC buggy into a Tauros one day? Anyway, there's also the seats, various roll cage parts, and of course some stubbers. 
That flare tip makes them look really good. Now, the original tower rosses back in the day, hold on, I've got one here. This is just the four wheeled version though. The original six wheeled long base tower ross came with two weapon options the las cannons and the multi lasers. So I'm hoping somewhere down the line the Elysians will get this kit back and they'll change the enforcer sprue with the concussion cannons on out for an Elysian sprue with the multi laser and las cannons on. I hope. They should do because this is the Elysians vehicle really isn't it? Not the enforcers, they're just borrowing it for a few minutes. Before we begin the build, I like to get out all my kit building equipment. I am the ultimate assembler, state of the assembling art. You do not want to fuck with me. We've got glues, knives, drills, cutters, and blue tack. We've got tweezers, we got files, we got sandpaper. You can sand half a city with this puppy. What? Knock it off, Marcel. I just realised I said I had some files, but I didn't show them in shot. This is my file set. They come from the same place as Andy the Knife, Billy Bobbins. I've no idea what that scum is that's stuck to the top though. Looks like some sort of secreted resin. Yeah, but secreted from what? Now before we move on, I just want to let you know this is the first video in the Anfelian Project series. First proper video anyway. A series where we're recreating the armies and scenarios of the Anfelian project. The actual project plan outline can be seen up here somewhere. If you're interested, that is. To build a part, we have to remove it from the sprue. Marcel's using Camia cutters to do this. Tamia. You said you check this. <laughs> Marcel's using Tamia cutters to do this. They are starting to dull now, so it might be time for some new ones. Anyone got any recommendations? Before we can glue parts together, we have to clean the sprue attachment points and mould lines. Marcel uses a knife to do this, and occasionally a file. Here is the part all free from the sprue and cleaned up ready to assemble. This is the biggest part in the whole kit, you know. Now going forward in this video, I won't be showing you me removing parts from sprues anymore or cleaning them up. Once you've seen it once, you don't really want to be seeing it again, do you? We don't want to be repeating ourselves. We don't want to be repeating ourselves. So our first little collection of parts to assemble are the main tub chassis, a couple of floor plates with what looks like fuel filler caps on, and a couple of Tetris L shapes. To assemble the parts, I mostly use Tamiya Extra Thin Cement. After fitting the parts, I then sometimes wick some more cement into the join for a stronger bond. I learnt that technique from watching people build acrylic fish tanks. With all those parts glued on, we have most of the main chassis built already, and I'm liking the look of those tread plates. We love a bit of texture. One thing I have noticed about this new Tauros Venator, they've changed it from a galvanic electric motor to a liquid fuel engine. And you can tell by some of the parts on it. There's no longer batteries on there, there's fuel cans. And obviously there's some jerry cans stuck to the side. And there's also the exhaust pipes which weren't on the original. I wonder if that will ever be explained. Anyway. Next on the desk are these smaller parts. I believe what we have here are the oil pattern, parts of the drive shaft, some exhaust pipes, and what looks like external fish tank filters or those ice cream makers they use in Star Wars as props. With all those parts assembled, we have most of the underside assembled. It turn out, it turns out, those ice cream makers were the exhaust pipe tips. Be careful with those as they are easily lost to the carpet and never seen again. If anybody has any tips on how not to lose parts to your dreaded carpet, then please let me know or let us all know in the comments below. Next up are these things. At first I thought they were robotic flippers for a diver, but no they're not. Let's see where they go. Well it turns out they're part of the axle setup for the suspension. I'm intrigued to see how this all works out. We have the actual suspension up next. 
there's rather a lot of detail on there for a part that's underneath. I'm quite impressed. With that suspension wishbone set glued on, we have one third of the suspension complete. I'll carry on quickly so I don't leave you in suspense. Suspense? Suspension? I'll get my coat. Recently, Snakeworks Junior and I went out for a walk and we noticed the clouds were really quite weird that day. Some of them looked almost solid. It was very strange and reminded me of a scene from Ghostbusters. There's probably a scientific name for those clouds, but I don't know it. I'm betting some of you out there do though. Next up is another of those robotic flippers. Have any of you ever worn a pair of flippers when diving? I have or haven't, say when and why. No, that's your instruction. <laughs> Tell me these things. <laughs> I have. I went diving in Malaysia and it was a pretty scary experience. I would say I almost drowned, but I didn't. That sounds stupid. Carry off. That piece attaches to our previous suspension piece where you're building a sort of tube and shaft combination. Can you guess what part goes on next? If you guessed another wishbone suspension piece, then you would be correct. I can't tell if this is exactly the same as the previous piece or not. If we looked at the instructions, I would probably find out. Let's have a look. Hang on a minute. Look at this. On the instructions, this kit is called a Taurus Venator. I was sure it said a Tauros. What does the box say? The box says Taurus as well. I think I've just been Mandela affected. Hold on a minute. Let me just have a look on the website. <laughs> Is Tau Ross on the website too, which is right. Anyway, with that bit stuck on, we have this. I think that's all the suspension complete now, right? Well, it turns out it's not quite finished. We have this little thing to stick on. I've no idea what it is. It does remind me a little bit of the recognizers in Tron. Hello, hello, hello. That building looks a lot like the atmosphere processing plant in Aliens. A lot of people borrowed ideas from Aliens. Not surprising really considering how well designed it was. The Anfelian project borrows from it rather a lot, along with Predator and Jurassic Park and The Empire Strikes Back. I'm looking at you, Dagobah. Anyway, getting back to our Tauros, or Taurus, whatever the hell it's really called, we have that part attached. It's basically the end cap of the suspension and drive shaft. But we are not finished with the suspension. Oh no. It turns out we have yet another wishbone piece. This one looks a little different to the others. Why is that I hear you ask? Well, it's because it's for the front wheels this time. Hopefully with that last suspension piece attached. All the chassis parts are finished and we can move on. Now, if you were an expert modeler, you could probably model those suspension arms to be in different positions, you know, going over rugged terrain or even turning the wheels. But I do apologize for getting off track again. But I just wanted to drive that point across. I'll get my coat again. Next up, we have some little plastic baby sandworms. Don't tell the Fremen I have these or they will come knocking. Shy halud. So it turns out we hadn't finished the suspension. These little sandworms, I think the correct term is sand trout, finish off the suspension. I assume these are brake lines or something. Which is quite interesting as it implies the Tauros only has brakes on the front wheels. And with those pipes attached, the chassis and running gear are finally finished. Running gear as in the mechanical running gear, not your Lycra vest and uh, shorts. Okay, we are finally into something different now. Here we have the front brush guard or sump protector, whatever you want to call it. Off-roading hobbyists amongst you will probably know, and there are also the pipes to attach it. No sandworms this time. With that piece attached, we are well on the way to finishing the model. Perhaps. 
I think it's looking really cool already. Now, I'm not going to lie, the Tauros, or Taurus, is one of the best looking vehicles in all of the Warhammer 40,000 universe. But I still can't decide if I prefer the original four-wheeled version or the six-wheeled version. Well, six wheels or ten wheel to be precise, as those rear wheels are doubled up. OK, we have a nice little ensemble of parts up next. The turret ring, the front lights, which are again very small, so be careful you don't lose those, and what appears to be a fire extinguisher. It's either that or NOS. I need NOS. I need NOS. We've glued the NOS bottle and the lights in, but I'm leaving the turret ring off to paint separately. That way we can access the insides. There's a few details in there we wouldn't be able to reach with it glued on. Right then, it's some wheels next. We begin with the front wheels, as they have to be assembled differently to the rest. First up, we have a pair of wheel sides, which are different, so be careful when picking these parts out, and also this little wheel hub thing. With those pieces all assembled, we have our first front wheel. Now, the second front wheel goes together much the same way, but you have to be careful to get the hub on the correct side of the wheel to make sure the tyre tread is facing the correct way. You don't want to end up with two left wheels, because that wouldn't be right. I'll get my coat. I think I've got my coat three times already in this video. So much for two thin coats. I don't need to get my coat for that one. All the rest of the wheels are all made in the same exact same manner, so we decided to factory line them. Boring, but efficient. 16 wheel sides makes 8 wheels, assuming my maths is correct. Now fun fact, here in the UK we call it maths, with an S. But I think in the old USA they just call it math. I first noticed it on Buffy the Vampire Slayer back in, what, the early 1990s? Terrible TV show. It's rubbish. OK, next up we have these strange looking nubs. They appear to have wheel nut looking parts on, so we can assume they're something to do with the wheels. Again, these are tiny pieces, so be careful you don't drop them and feed them to your carpet. Those little nubs are actually the connecting parts for the wheels. Are they called spacers? I've seen them on trucks and things, but never really knew what they're called. I'm sure an automotive expert will be along shortly to tell us what they're called. We're waiting! Right, so it's time to build the crew. As we are building this Tauros for the D99, we won't be using the Enforcer crew. Well, not all of their parts anyway. We've managed to procure some Imperial Guard Sentinel pilot parts, both the chests, arms and heads to swap out for the Enforcers. Let's see how difficult this is, shall we? I have to be honest here and say ahead of time, it ended up being a little less straightforward than I expected. Not hard, just a bit of a faff, you know? You'll see why as we move along the project. Here we can see the parts we want to use for the driver. We are using the Enforcers legs and we have the torso and arms from a Sentinel pilot. Attaching the torso was really quite easy, however the arms were a bit of a bugger to attach to the steering wheel. I had to cut the Sentinel pilot's hands off and attach them to the hands on the steering wheel, which left some gaps to fill later. I thought I would tackle the gunner at the same time, so here are the bits we want for that. This time we have to cut the torso off the Enforcer's legs to be able to use our Imperial Guard torso. After a little cutting and sticking, we have this, a torso, in a chair. Please ignore the gap between the two belts. Funnily enough, I used to work with a guy called Mikey Two Belts. Hello Mikey, if you're watching, he's more likely to be watching the football. OK, so to complete the gunner, we need to do a lot of faffing. We would like to be able to paint the crew separately, so we need to assemble some of this to see if it's possible to make them removable. Here we've assembled the turret ring with the joysticks in place. It took Marcel about four attempts to get these in the correct position. He kept putting them on backwards. Now while those little fiddly bits dry, let's return to the driver. 
We have this little dashboard piece to attach and we don't know if gluing that on will prevent us from removing the driver. Let's find out. Well it turns out we can still remove the driver, but we do have a small issue. The steering wheel doesn't connect with the dashboard. The new arms are too short. Let's see if we can bodge it somehow. To do this, we needed to find a suitable shaft. Having a poke about on the sprues I had to hand, I noticed the Enforcer's pistol arm. I was never going to use it, so that barrel on the pistol should do nicely. After some precarious cutting and snipping, we had this, a teeny tiny shaft. It's really hard to handle due to it being so small. A bigger shaft would have been preferable. Oh well, let's see if we can get it all assembled. There we go, the steering wheel now pretty much connects with that shaft. It's not perfect, but at arm's length, nobody's going to know. Especially when the driver is all glued in and secure. Sometimes I do have to remind myself, good enough is good enough sometimes. Nobody's ever going to notice it, so we can move on. Here we have the roll cage and what appears to be the world's smallest strut brace. Fun fact, on the original resin version, this part was more square. Again, we don't want the roll cage glued on as we need access for paint. The roll cage and the turret ring also slot together so we had to do some tests. Luckily the test was passed and we can leave them separate. The next parts on our assembly line are the side panels with attached side skirt, mud flat parts and the rear panels which have the lights built in. With all those parts attached, I have built a happy little face. What shall we call him? The first person to provide a name in the comments wins. Now please make sure that name is a suitable name, not something odd like pipe or deodorant. Although those names would be fine, I guess. Amusingly, for people reading the comments without watching the whole video, might get a little confused. But that's half the fun, right? Okay, so here we have another couple of really tiny parts. A couple of plastic bananas. Where do these go, I hear you ask? Let's have a look. Well, it turns out the bananas make the rear toe hook. I feel this didn't really need to be in two pieces myself, unless there's some sort of towable kit coming later down the line. Little towable tarantulas and other sentry guns would be awesome. What set did that twin-linked heavy bolter on like a wheeled trailer come in? Was it one of the kill team boxes, the one, the boarding actions thing? I remember seeing the advert for it, but never seeing it come out. Did it even come out? Now we have to attach the gunner's arms in the correct position without gluing them to the controls. We add a little glue to the arm and shoulder and carefully hold the arms in position. That pretty much worked. Again, it's not perfect, but nobody's ever going to notice the little gaps under his hands. If they do, we'll say they got hot. So he's just having to let go for a few seconds. Ooh. Like that, I suppose. <laughs> We have some interesting but spindly parts up next. The straight rod is an aerial and the curved one is a seat cage. It's like a roll cage but it's attached to the seat, a bit like a roller coaster. With those parts attached to the turret ring, you can see what I mean. Is there a proper name for that safety cage? Is it just another roll bar? Anyway, next up we have three odd looking parts. Well, this is the gunner's front shield and the two weapon mounting points. With all those parts attached, we have this. The shield thing didn't really have a proper attachment point. It just sort of butts up against the ring piece. Unless I've got it wrong somehow. Which is entirely possible and quite likely. Okay, here are the weapons we will be using. The heavy stabbers. Stop no, it. you need to check this. Okay, here are the weapons we will be using, the heavy stubbers. Lovely looking sculpts, but sadly, need the barrels drilling out. <laughs> That's what it says! <laughs> it's mini barrel drilling tutorial time. The first thing we do is take a sharp knife or poking implement and poke as close to the centre of the barrel as you can. This is to create a depression for the drill bit to bite into. Next up, we take our little drill with a small drill bit and then begin drilling out our guide hole. 
I made sure to check it's central. With the guide holes drilled, we have a good start, but we now need to open those holes up a bit. We then unwrap one of our Christmas presents, another pin vise. This one is from Gale Force 9. Interestingly, the new pin vise is exactly the same as my current one, it just has a blue handle part. Good, I like my pin vise. You're probably wondering why we now have two. Well, it's because I can now leave my guide hole drill bit in one of the drills, so I don't have to keep changing the drill bit. All right then, using a bigger drill bit, we then open up the first millimetre or so of those gun barrel holes. Make sure your drill bit isn't too big or you'll chew your barrels up. With the hole widened, we have the correct size barrel. However, it's still not quite right. We need to smooth out that edge. We then take an even bigger drill bit and just spin it by hand inside that barrel tip to chamfer the inside edge. Don't use any force or you'll wreck the barrel. Go slowly and gently. With the barrel tip chamfered, we have the drilling stages complete. However, it looks a bit messy, doesn't it? So let's fix that. Taking just a little extra thin cement, rub this around the tip. This will smooth out all those machined edges. Don't use thick cement or you will melt your gun barrel, ruining all your hard work. When the glue has dried, after just a few seconds, we have these. Some wonderfully professional looking drilled gun barrels. And I'm really pleased with how they turned out. You don't have to drill your barrels, of course. But I always find it adds a lot to the look of the miniature. It turns it from a toy into a scale model. Now the instructions tell us to stick the weapons on here. We won't be doing that as we A want to paint them separately and B have the option to swap them out later on down the road. The next thing we did was add the turret and gunner to the main chassis to make sure everything fits okay and was still easy to pull apart for painting in sub-assemblies. It's all looking good so far. Okay, so I fancied adding a little something here. The front brush guard is very plain, but the original resin tower Ross had a little Aquila on there. I found this big one from one of the Heresy vehicle kits and trimmed the lightning bolts off. I wasn't sure if I wanted it on there or not, so I put it to vote on Instagram. I didn't care about the Instagram vote and decided I wanted it on there so it's going on. The Instagram vote went the same way anyway. Now, I've explained it away by saying, as the D99 are attached to the Inquisition, they might have a little more embellishment than the standard usual guard regiments, or something like that. Can you guys think of any better reasons? Anyway, if you want to get your hands on your own Tauros Venator to maybe embellish a little, then check out the link up here somewhere. I'll also put one down in the description below for you. Okay. It's now the time to add the heads. I didn't have any spare Elysian heads handy, but these Sentinel pilots heads are quite generic due to having no helmets. I've decided to use the guy with a face mask and goggles as my driver, and the guy with a sort of Biggles pilot hat as my gunner. I do love a bit of Biggles, you know. If you can fly a sock with camel, you can fly anything. There we are! I feel like they should have made some more Biggles movies. Maybe without the time travel element though. So, with those head glued onto the bodies, our crew are also finally finished. Although I do see a small issue we need to address. To get the hands in the correct position, we have ended up with these gaps in the shoulders. I'm not entirely sure that looks natural, so we better do something about them. We've got a tube of this Vallejo plastic putty from around 1978 that hopefully hasn't gone off in the tube and is still usable. Luckily, it's still soft enough to squeeze out so we apply a few blobs to those gaps. Marcel tried to do this as tidily as he could with a camera in his face. He's so clever. I'm really proud of him. It was in fact a little awkward, I'll have you know. If you would like to come and discuss converting crew miniatures, then please feel free to come and join our friendly Discord server, which is not 
behind a paywall. Again, I'll put a little link for you up here somewhere, and there's also one down in the description below. We look forward to seeing you there. I used a wet paintbrush to smooth out the filler and then let them dry. I think they will look perfectly fine with some paint on there. The driver even had gaps on the back of his hands, which were rather fiddly to fill and tidy. Anyway, with those gaps sorted, the crew, and therefore the Tauros, is finished. Now, while we put our paints away, I just want to give a massive shout out to our channel members and Patreons. Dan Yellop, Lee Blackley, Donald, Pine Tree, Bobzilla, Charles Marlowe, Andrew Marrington, Dr. Lee, Nick Ellingham, and our newest member, Briars and Bantams. Thank you all so, so much for supporting us. We love you all. We really do. Oh, by the way, the Tauros kit also comes with a few stowage options. Now, I considered sticking these on, but I think I'm going to save them for another project. Here, let me show you. This is my Elysian support vehicle. It's just a Tower Rocks with some random wheels stuck on. I found them in a box somewhere, so God knows where they came from. I'm going to add lots of stowage to this. In my head, it's a bit like the command vehicle from Megaforce. I've just realised there's a lot of buggies in that movie, which are also conveniently getting dropped into battle, like the Tauros. Have a look for yourself. Coincidence? I think not. I know what these game designers were watching when they were growing up. I was there too, you know. Interesting story, I first saw Megaforce on VHS in the hospital waiting room when I was a youngster waiting for an operation. I was either A, having my tonsils taken out, or B, having my testicle manually dropped. Now talking of operations, if you'd like to partake in an important one, then please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. That means you, Aaron. Also, remember Mrs. Snakeworks has said when we hit 10,000 subscribers, we're allowed to get a Warhound Titan. So let's try and smash that target ASAP. If you are enjoying the content on this channel, then please consider joining us on Patreon, the link to which is in the description below or up here somewhere. Anyway, without further ado, let's check out the finished article, shall we? So here we have it, the completed Tauros, or should I say, Taurus. This kit was an absolute blast to put together and I think it looks really, really good. One of the best looking vehicles in Warhammer 40k, I reckon. Putting it together was an absolute joy, although my crew conversions proved to be a bit of a pain. All in all, I'm really looking forward to slapping some paint on this thing and having the first unit of Detachment 99 ready to roll. Finished! We will tackle the painting of the Tauros in the next video, so stay tuned for that. And as always, thank you very much for watching.